top down and your Maui's on like some kind of movie star. The house you had is big, your jewelry and your clothes so elegant. I'd like to get to know you, but I can't afford your rent. I see the pain behind your eyes because you know just what you are. You're a thing to him, a trophy. Like his house, his boat, his car And I wonder where your pride And I wonder where your dignity went You and I would be quite a pair But I can't afford your rent I'd buy you a bottle But my money's always spent So much to you It's what's in the way Yeah I'd like to get to know you But I can't afford your
Hello, hey, everyone. Tulsa Music Stream. This is episode 49, and tonight's um, guest is uh, JJ French from the Twisted Sister. Yes, band. the one and only. <laughs> we are awaiting JJ's arrival. He's in New York. Scott told me something interesting about JJ that I did not know, and I'm sure this will come up in the interview. He has lived in the same apartment since what year, Scott? Uh, I believe it's 1958 or something Mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, something like that. That is amazing. So we're looking forward to getting into all things J.J. French. We've got a lot to talk about with him. He's just released a book, and I actually, I ordered it, and it's it's tracking to arrive tomorrow, but we're going to get into that because it's, He's probably one of the smartest business minds in the music business, and I cannot wait to pick his brain about some of that, sure. in addition to getting into the Twisted Sister story. Uh, so it's going to be a really good night. We're really excited to get to talk to him here in moments as we await his arrival. How have you guys been? How was your week? How was your new year? That was good. Uh, good. Had fun. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Great. It's a Did new a year. Of, yeah. Happy new year, everybody. You too. Yeah. Make sure you guys... Um, Share our stream on your Facebook pages, on your in your favorite groups. Of course, um, we are also are on YouTube. If you're watching from YouTube, or you hit subscribe, and then uh, that way every time we go live, you'll get the notification. So uh, just hit that little bell guy, and uh, that'd be great. Also, we're on Twitch and Twitter. So you know all those little platforms that you uh, want to go to, go for it and. Um, Share it. Get involved with us. Yeah. Going to ask some questions and, um, you know, kind of uh, help us uh, guide this guy along. I think he's going to guide us along. He is. (laughs) Yes. He is. Tell us a little bit about your New Year's Eve show, Nine. How did that go for you? It went great. It was, it was, it was, it was a fun night and um, we rang in 22 with, with a, with a bang. So good. Yeah. Always a good time in Salem Springs at the Cherokee Casino there. For sure. One thing I will mention while we wait um, that we're really excited about, we have a new a new sponsor tonight. We had someone reach out to us, and they, they uh, I mean, it's always a good sign when someone feels like your, your live stream or your podcast is getting enough traffic to where they want to advertise on it. So we had someone reach out, and we'll, uh, we'll be talking about them here momentarily. Here is JJ. He is coming in, so we're going to get him all set up here. I knew he'd be here because he's a total pro at everything he does. Mm-hmm. And we'll get his audio going. Well, 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 well. Hey, bud. Hi. How you doing? So we have Rush there. Okay. Hey, guys. <laughs> hey, hey, can you hear us okay? A three-parter. I like it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, now I get your joke. That Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. It took a second, right? Okay. All right. We're still waking up from the day job. We're trying to, to get our brains in JJ French Oh, that's French right. Mode. You guys, you guys work and you have to do this at a specific hour, don't you? We, we do. <laughs> and we appreciate you accommodating that, JJ. Hey, we, we've accommodated Switzerland hours before, so. He's not lying. No. We're not. We interviewed, uh, who was it? Mark. Mark uh, Storacci. Mark Storacci yeah. from Crocus. Yeah. So. Oh, my gosh, really. Okay. All hours. And I know you have some stories about that because you told yeah, I'd rather Crocus. not bother. I don't like to waste my time on things. I don't like to waste my time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to move right along then. Hey, we really appreciate you joining us tonight, J.J. French from Twisted Sister. Thank you so much for doing that. Now, I know the three of us are so pumped to talk about Twisted Sister, and we're going to get to that. But we need an education tonight as well. We're looking forward to being educated by you because if anyone knows about the business side of the music business, it is certainly you. So I want to put this up on the screen. Uh, This is your new book called Twisted Business Lessons from My Life in Rock and Roll by J.J. French and Steve Farber. If you don't mind, talk a little bit about the process of of creating this book, why you wanted to create it, and what you most hope your readers will take away from it. Uh, Well, um, I started out as a member of Twisted Sister uh, almost 50 years ago, 49 years ago, as a matter of fact, this week I auditioned, and I was the guitar player and thought I was just going to be a guitar player, and that was it. And what happened was uh, life got in the way, and uh, things occurred over the following 10 years in the bars, because uh, that's how long we played in the bars before we got signed. Mm-hmm. Um, and what happened was as time went on, I took over management because um, 
uh, the management was terrible. And, um, and I had a certain skill, I had a skill set. And most musicians don't have that skill set. And I had that skill set because I'm a New York hustler guy. You know, I started, you know, I, I, I go into depth in the book about how it all started. I sold Boy Scout cookies to get my first guitar. I moved to fireworks after that. And I moved to drugs after that. And I was a weed dealer for five years. I was way ahead of my time. Everyone's selling weed now, but I was <laughs> right, way yeah. ahead of my, I told you 50 years ago, you get into it. People weren't paying attention, <laughs> uh, but I was making a lot of money really fast. And I'm a New York kid. And when you're growing in New York, you, when you're a New York kid, your father works on 47th street, which is the jewelry district. And you go to 48th street, which is the, which is the music district and you're at the Fillmore East and, you know, and it's the sixties and all of that energy that comes into play. Um, you either sink or swim. So what my life was with that was not that unusual for a lot of my friends. So we were involved with sex, drugs, rock and roll, politics, anti-war stuff. Remember, this is the 60s. OK, mm -hmm. so be really clear about this. This was a crazy time, a political time. You're living in New York City. You know, everybody's against, you know, unlike today, everybody was against the war. You know, like there was no there was no, uh, you know, Trumpy and this and left and that like. If you got up on stage at Woodstock and there's 400,000 people there and you scream, the war sucks, everybody screamed, the war sucks. You had right. no fighting inside it. This is not today's world, but it was the world back then. Back then it was over 30, under 30. That was really it. It was really simple. Also to keep in mind, when I was 17 years old, my idols, which are the Beatles, Stones, Who, Zepp, Floyd, Joplin, Hendrix, uh, you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash, Young, The Who, you name it. They were 27 years old. Think about think about that. Yeah. All these ridiculously unbelievable rock stars were no older than 10 years older than me. Right. When people say to me, you know, is, you know, is rock dead? I go, it may not be dead, but can you list any 26 year old rock stars right now right. of the magnitude of Jimi Hendrix, the, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Grateful Dead? You can't. Right. They don't exist. That's right. So so you can make all the arguments you want and that's fine, but they don't exist. you got plenty of rap stars and you got plenty of hip hop and you have plenty of uh, female uh, pop artists and you have K-pop artists <laughs> and all that. And they're all young, but you got no rock stars that are. 26 27 right. and it's kind right. of incredible so we had a now. really great uh it was a great time to grow up and um so i learned my i learned on the street i as a drug dealer i cover it in the book i don't i'm not romanticizing it so let me be really clear about the book i don't romanticize the drug period i talk about the fact that it was a reality i talk about the fact the hippie thing was huge i talk about the fact that I almost died on a number of occasions, either ODs or bad drug deals, almost murdered. Um, my girlfriend was the great granddaughter of Robert E. Lee. She dated me because I was a New York Jew who was a drug dealer and thought that would scare the hell out of her mother. And she ticked all the boxes. You know, it certainly did. Uh, so uh, it was a crazy time. And just as I was about to probably get killed or OD for the last time, I was plucked off the iceberg of self-destruction. Um, in a way that I can't describe it because it was just a self-realization. I woke up one day and went, at this rate, uh, I'm going to die. I'm either going to be murdered or I'm going to OD and find myself in a bad situation. So it's either straight or not. And I became straight. And I became so straight that I became the most boring straight person on the planet Earth as a rebellion against what I was, which was this drug dealing crazy hippie. So I joined a rock band called Silver Star yeah. because I was transforming from a Grateful Dead hippie into a David Bowie glam glitter guy, mm -hmm. uh, which is illustrated in the book with pictures and all that. It's 1972. And um, and I joined a band that was working a lot. And back in those days, you work a lot. You know, back in those days, the bar scene was very, very big and you could work six days a week. You know, you can't do that today. The bar scene doesn't exist. But right. the drinking age was 18 in those days. So mm -hmm. think about this for a minute. Drinking age is 18. And I.D. is not very sophisticated. You can make it fake ID in shop class, which doesn't even exist anymore. I don't think any high school has shop class anymore. <laughs> like what an old fashioned phrase. Do you guys remember shop class? Of course. Yes, yes, of course. It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> but back in shop class, you can make hash pipes. I mean, you do all the crazy shit that you want to. I stole my triple beam scale to weigh my drugs for my chemistry class. I mean, I mean, school was very good for me, you know?
So, uh, so anyway, you're playing in the bars and you work six nights a week. You play five shows a night and you do, and, and pretty soon, guess what? You get good because you play a lot, you know, now let's look at today. Uh, a 20 year old kid comes up to me and he goes, Hey, JJ, I want you to go see my band. And I say, how long have you been together? And they go two years. And I go, Oh, how many shows do you play in two years? And they go, Oh, 50 shows. I go, Oh, 50, like 50, 45 minute shows. Yeah. I said, wow. Okay, cool. When you get to 500, call me, I'll come and see your band. 500. That'll never happen. I said, well, there's a good chance I won't come and see your band because you're going to suck until you hit about 500. And I have no intention of wasting my time while you suck. I said, <laughs> you should practice a lot and get better. So let me put this in perspective for you guys, which I illustrate in the book. Starting in March of 73 to the first break we took, which was Labor Day weekend 75, which was 12, 32 months of time, Twisted Sister played 3,200 shows. Jeez. Mm. In two mm. years. Jeez. Okay. Now, D joins in 76 with Eddie. We spent another five years in the bars. So you add on to that 3,500 shows, another. 4,000. Wow. 5,000. By the time the band was signed, we were at 8,000 performances. Jeez. That's how you get, that's how you get good. I talk about it in the book. It's called the boredom of excellence. Mm -hmm. You do it over and over and over again, you know, and you become great. So right. my pearls of wisdom, <laughs> pearls of wisdom you know, is very simple. You got to work your ass off to be good. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, here's some real simple way to look at it. When you're watching uh, the Olympics and you see the guy who, or the girl who wins the gold medal skiing, they win the gold medal because they've been up at four o'clock in the morning doing this eight hours a day for 20 years. That's why they win the gold medal. Right. You and I aren't doing it, but they are. And that's why they win the gold medal, right? Mm -hmm. when, you go to a, or, when you go to an opera or an orchestra, uh, you go to a classical music concert and there's you see first row, first chair violin player, uh, you know, that person got up at four o'clock in the morning, 10 hours a day, for 15 years and that's why the person's first chair uh, there it's very simple sure right sure. so Excellent. how do you become a great live act you play a lot <laughs> repetition a lot. and and that you, you did know, um, and that we did yes we did which is why the band is 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 bulletproof which is why um if you think about this how many bands are there in this world that a promoter would trust 100,000 people to to close out a festival, mm -hmm. knowing that the festival lives and dies on the quality of that particular performance that day. Mm -hmm. So sure. if you suck, you take the festival down with you, right. not to mention the fact that your fans hate you, okay? Right. How many bands are there? Maybe 30 in the world, Metallica, Kiss, Judas Priest, ACDC, Guns N' Roses. I mean, you can, you can count them on two hands, three hands, maybe. So we're one of those bands that uh, did it so much that we could do it and we could do it. We've been retired for five years, but we could do it tomorrow if I had to. Right. Because um, that's what you learn how to do. Now, so is it, it's not magic, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a lot of work. Right. All that grinding, grinding out you did, how many times did you just tell yourself, I got to get out of this? Or did you just just want to keep going and keep well, going. Well, in the book, I describe several times where that happened, mm -hmm. voluntarily or not. You know, we we we, you know, we hit we hit a brick wall on a number of occasions. Yes. And in the book, I talk about that brick wall. You know, and I talk about uh, because it's a business book. It's not about a rock and roll band. It's about any business. You know, and I talk about how you turn roadblocks into pathways. That sounds like a cliche, but every business is the same business. It's just the product changes. Right. I don't care if it's rock and roll and I don't care if it's selling cement and I don't care if it's building a building or selling shoes. Mm -hmm. well, the issues that businesses have are the same. So when I put a business book together, I this book was a biz war, a business book and a memoir. I coined the phrase biz war. It's a, it's a, it's a um, memoir in the beginning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then it transforms to a business book in which all the lessons that I believe that Twisted Sister followed, not that we followed them because we knew what we were doing. We instinctively followed them. But in looking back, I was able to find the pattern of how we did it. And I give explicit instructions. Seven steps, it's, right? All the steps, the twisted method of reinvention. Yep. which is take the word twisted because it's easy to just use the word twisted. 
and look at the T-W-I-S-T-E-D, tenacity, wisdom, inspiration, stability, trust, excellence, and discipline, and I turn them all into lessons. Now, Steve Farber, my co-writer, Steve Farber is a professional uh, business um, consultant. Mm -hmm. And I met him because I heard him speak one day at a conference and I thought he was amazing. And I, we had lunch the next day and I just wanted to tell him, man, you know, you do your thing the way I do my thing. Like, mm -hmm. I just wanted to tell him how much I appreciated watching him do his performance mm -hmm. art, you know, because the, all these guys are, whether it's Tony Robbins, it's, it's a, I hate to say this because it sounds cynical, but it's a shtick. You know, you learn it's a performance art. How do you sell an idea? And Steve's, Steve was promoting his book and we sat down and we kind of became friends. And then I started to appear at his uh, extreme leadership conferences. And then my book has been coming and going and coming and going for 30 years. I tried it, it failed, I tried it, failed, I tried it, failed. And Steve said, you need a book. And truthfully, when I started doing my motivational speaking, the first thing that a book, that a, the booker, the agent goes is you have a book. Everybody needs a book, like, where's your book? Said, well, okay, I guess I need a book. <laughs> so Steve and I sat down and we started to put the outline of the book together. But it, what happened was the twisted method of reinvention, which is what I'm really proud about, evolved during the five years that we were writing the book. Like one day I was going out for a walk, which I do almost every day. I walk for four or five miles a day. It clears my head. Um, and, uh, and it dawned on me. I said, that's how you sell it. You know, that's how you sell it. And I could give you explicit Ex uh, and I called Steve. I said, T Steve, I got the idea, the Twisted Method for Reinvention. And that's how, um, that's how that came about. Well, we just want to encourage everyone. You can get it on Amazon. There's many outlets you can get it. Pick up JJ's book. I have it on order. It's tracking to arrive tomorrow. So I'm really anxious to dig into it. The three of us are in. I want the audio book. <laughs> yeah, I'll get you that for a, for a, your birthday. That's coming up. But, I, you know, the three of us are in, in music groups here on a local level. And the business side of it has always fascinated me. That's kind of that's kind of my niche, too. And I and so really appreciate picking your brain on that. I want to ask you one more quick thing and then we'll I know the guys have some stuff for you. But now that you've had several years removed from the band and you've had this time to reflect on on just the whole process, the grind leading up to making it and then the, the process of making it and enjoying the fruits of that labor in a weird way do you almost do you appreciate the grind part of it as much as you did the second half or was the second half just way better and you know that's definitely your favorite part of that whole process mm. you know that's a great question mm -hmm. and it's a complicated answer mm. because there's good and bad about every aspect of what we went through Sure. Like every aspect of it had its good points and its bad points, its high points and its low points. Um, if I had to add up like the high points, like there was maybe five or six high points along the way, which wouldn't be the more obvious high points that you could possibly think that the high points would be like, oh, when you first played in front of 100,000 people, or oh, when you first got a, your album went double platinum, or oh, when you first did this. I mean, those are the obvious ones. And I guess in a way they could be benchmarks, but we were working so hard. I didn't even recognize them when they were coming because sure. it was just like, oh, it's another gig. It's another job. Like right. things just move, just kept moving in a way, I think um, looking back at the tough days, how we got through the tough days is the part that I find most fascinating for me, Absolutely. because um, let's face it, man. I mean, you know, life's hard. It, becoming successful is really hard. It pushes every button. I have to say this, if it wasn't for my partners, I wouldn't be here. Right. I talk about this in the book. I talk about the collaborative, the, collab the importance of collaboration. I'm not a singer. I'm not a songwriter. If I'm not with D, he doesn't write. We're not going to take it. Chances are you're not interviewing me. And Twisted Sisters is not one of the more famous bands in the world. Sure. Chances are that's just not the way it's going to peel itself out. I mean, it could, but probably not. OK, mm -hmm. so, you know, if men, you know, I, I look at Eddie Ojeda, I look at Mark and I look at D and I go, they, they sacrifice just as much as me. Right. You know, we all rolled the dice with no backstop. We just kind of we roll the dice and, and, you know, in the book, I quote Ahmed Erdogan, the chairman of Atlantic Records. I don't ask too many people for advice. You'll see in the book. I've asked a couple of people for advice. And the, 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 the two uh, pieces of advice I got 
One was Tommy James from Tommy James and the Shondells. I don't know if you know who they of are. Of course, but yes. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good. So Tommy James was playing at a, at a corner bar in 1976, and we were on the bill, and Dia just joined at that point. So it was 1976. Twist has been around for three years already, but we were on the downswing. We had to come back up, which is why we hired D, because we needed to we needed to change our um, image and everything, and D could sing Zeppelin. And that's why we hired D because he could sing Zeppelin perfectly. Mm -hmm. And in those days, 75, 76, 77, all the big bands were doing perfect renditions of Zeppelin, for example. So we're playing a corner bar called the 1890s in Baldwin. And I remember Tommy James is on the bill. Now I'm thinking to myself, at this point, I'm 24 and I'm in the dressing room and I'm thinking to myself, what is Tommy James thinking? right now like here's a guy who in 66 67 had numbers and number number one hits constantly mm -hmm. and had played in front of thousands of people and and sold out amusement parks and you know whatever and here he is playing a corner bar in baldwin long island now for us it was an important gig mm -hmm. for him i'm trying to figure out how he's processing this gig because it's got to be depressing to play in front of 300 people for us wow it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. So we finish our set and we're walking down the stairs and he, Tommy James is walking up the stairs. And I'm, I, I want to get Tommy on my show, on my podcast, mm -hmm. because I'm sure he doesn't remember the conversation, but I want to thank him. And I said to him, what advice do you have for, for me, for me, for the band? And uh, he looked at me and without any sense of uh, cynicism or irony, he just said, um, treat the people that you meet the same way on your way up as you do on the way down, because mm -hmm. you never know uh, if you're going to need them again, if things get tough. So true. God, and I, and although it was instinctive to me to believe that I, to hear it from another professional was interesting because that's how we always operated. We always, you know, when, when certain nights were tough in the bars and people weren't coming out, we kicked back money to the club owner. We always did things so that when we were having a tough time drawing and, and People, of course, romanticize Twisted Sister and think we sold out every single night, right. six nights a week, five nights a week for like 10 years. And we did not. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of problems. We had two gas crises that affect things. We had the Son of Sam shooting women for a year, which oh, yeah. which, which screwed up stuff in the clubs. You know, there was Jeez. a lot of problems we had. Um, and there were mm -hmm. nights that were not great nights. But on those nights that were not great nights, we would say to the club owner, listen, man, you know, here's a couple hundred dollars back. We didn't draw the people we needed to draw. And they always remembered. Sure. So when things got tough and I needed to get an extra m couple of hundred dollars more radio commercials for a gig on a weekend, like, you know, you'd buy radio time, they, they would come up with the money. Mm -hmm. They'd say, sure, you know, that kind of a thing. Right. Um, and, 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 and so that, that's where the other piece of advice from Ronnie Altman, excuse me, the, from Ahmed Erdogan was, um, I asked him how Atlantic Records stayed successful over its 50 year history, you know, starting with John Coltrane and jazz and then moving up through the doo -wop era and then the Drifters and the and then Led Zeppelin and Crosby, Stills, Nash and ACDC and then Twisted Sister and then on and on and on and on and on. And how do you survive? How do you do that? Mm -hmm. And he said a couple of things to me. He said, number one, if I had a record label with just the artists I love, I'd be broke. So I had to hire people who could hear and I had to trust what they heard. Right. And the other thing is, um, success is easier if you don't mind who gets the credit. And I yeah. went, wow. That's so shit. true. Absolutely. That's incredible to sublimate your ego that much. But yeah. I, you know, when it comes to my singer, D, you know, I sublimated my ego enough. And because of that, I'm here talking to you. So you that's it. The other piece is that uh, a, a company, a, a, rec a um, lighting company, um, I tell the story of a guy named Ronnie Altman who gave the band a lot, a lot of lighting gear in the early days and we had no money. And he gave me the lighting gear for very little money. And I just remember what he said to me. He said, I'm helping you out because I was told by somebody in my factory that you're a really good band. He goes, I'm going to give you this really huge light show Wow. for $25 a week. You can pay that, right? I said, yeah. He said, listen to me. I expect that $25 a week. He goes, I don't care how you get it to me. I don't care if it comes down to carrier pigeon. I don't care if you nail it. I don't care if you push it. <laughs> but I want that $25 a week. And he says, and if you fuck me for that $25, you will have lost one of the best friends you'll ever have in this business because mm. frankly, what I'm giving you as a lighting rig doesn't mean shit to me. He goes, wow. I run one of the biggest lighting companies in the world. I sell super troopers to Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. He said, and years later, I said to him, that was the most extraordinary thing. And he said, all I wanted to know is that your word was good. 
Wow. Yeah. All I wanted to know is that you were going to say what you, you know, you say what you're going to do, do what you're going to say. I hate to sound so damn like conservative. I hate to sound like, you know, but this is the fucking truth. You want to sure. know how we did it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did it with good songs and all that other stuff. But we did it with basic business sense. You that's know, right. Understanding that you, that that's how you applied. That's you, how you succeeded sure. by, by, by being good business people and responsible business people. Even Makes though total sense. We and, sell this dream. It's sex, drugs, rock and roll, and fairy dust. That's the dream we sell. Sure, sure. Right. Mm. Meanwhile, you know, if you got high in my band, we fired you. Right. There was no tolerance for drugs and alcohol in Twisted Sister. You know, we had zero tolerance. Now, that runs completely in the face of, you know, don't ask me about Motley Crue and Rat and all that. They do what they do, and that's their business. Sure. But uh, we got burned so many times with dr with drug addicts. Uh, as former band members, I got sick of it, you know? Yeah. So D comes on, he goes, I never did drugs or drink. I went, wow, you're my guy. You know, Mendoza <laughs> comes in, I hate drugs and alcohol. You're my guy. Yeah. Right on. You're my guy. Yeah. You know? Why? Because the schedule's a bitch. You got to show up five nights a week and on the sixth day you rehearse and on the seventh day you sleep and you got to do it day after day and night after night. You get to the club at six o'clock in the evening, you do a sound check, you get home at six o'clock in the morning, you go to sleep, you wake up, you do it again, wash, rinse, repeat, wash, mm -hmm. rinse, repeat. Day after day, night after night, rehearse on the other off days. It's a brutal schedule. Sure. But it's not brutal if you're not fucked up. Guess what? You can do it. Yeah. Amen. But not if you're recovering from a hangover. That's right. right. Makes sense you to can't, me. You, you can't do it. Not not at that level. You can't. Well, it's the you same know? thing as being in a relationship with somebody who's doing that. You know, abusing chemicals or alcohol. It's just, it's the same kind of thing because a band is the same kind of a relationship. Yeah, it's a marriage. Right. Yep, right. For sure. I think Scott's got something for yeah, you, JJ. You, know, you you wear many hats. You know, you're yeah. an opportunity uh, entrepreneur. Uh, yes, um, manager, producer, all these things. And and recently, uh, I guess either yesterday or, or sometime you, you released a, a news source about you um, having to, I guess, threaten Harley Davidson and all this. And you said that, you know, you, having a trademark is a responsibility. Tell us a little bit of some of the responsibilities that come with that. You know, it's so interesting you bring that up. That story is so old. And, and it, is it wound really? up, is that story, that story, that happened 25 years ago. Oh, geez. Wow. And, and, um, and I and I've told the story a thousand times, and it just so happened that my friend Joe Rock, um, who's a DJ on Long Island, was at my house interviewing about the book, and I went over the story with him, and I told him, and, and then it got picked up, and I wondered why did it get picked up, and Joe Rock calls me today, he goes, hey, isn't it great, man? It's gone viral. So what's gone viral? Here's a story about uh, Harley Davidson. I said, really? That shit's like thirty years old. That's so amazing. what happened was um, about thirty years ago. Uh, well, he, okay, here's what first happened. Um, Six Flags decided to call a ride Twisted Sisters. Oh, and it's the geez. first time I ever challenged a a registration, and I own the name. So I sued them. And the lawsuit dragged on for three years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their their whole position was, well, you know, it's it's twin it's twin roller coasters and it's two sisters and it has nothing to do with your band <laughs> and no one's going to get, and no one will confuse it with twisted sister. And I said, really? So if you call the ride Led Zeppelins, <laughs> it's Led Zeppelin, right? So, um, I challenged them. It cost me a fortune and they mm. dropped it. They dropped, they changed the name. Okay. Wow. Then Sim my, enough. um, and then one day my ex-wife or I was married at the time says, you have a makeup line here at uh, Urban Decay. I said, what do you mean? She goes, yeah, it says uh, Twisted Sisters Eyeshadow. I went, what? Oh, boy. So I go, what, what, what? So I go to Bloomingdale's, and there's this thing that says Heavy Metal Saturday Nights, you know, and it's got eyeshadow, Judas Priest, uh, Metallica. Oh, I went, wow. holy crap. Nobody called me. I contacted Judas Priest, Metallica. And nobody called them either. We all sued the company. And they all just folded in two seconds. They trust try to get away with as much as they can away with as fast as they can get away with it. And then they pull back and you just want them to stop. Right. So that was the second encroachment. Jeez. That was really big. Wow. And then I get a phone call from Harley Davidson, some lawyer. And he goes, hey, man, listen, you know, uh, we did some research to find out you own the name Twisted Sister. We're going to name a tire Twisted Sister. And I'm letting you know that we're going to call the tire Twisted Sister. I'm going to send you a couple of tires as a thank you. <laughs> and I and I said to him. Are, are you for real? <laughs> I said, are you, are you for real? Are, are you telling me that you acknowledge I own the trademark and yet you're going to violate the trademark? That's, 
what you're telling me. I want to understand this. They go, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're Harley Davidson. Yeah, we, you know, we're like a $400 million mm. company. And I went, really? I said, I said, okay. I said, let me have your number. So I, I sit home, I'm thinking about this. I call the guy up about an hour later and I go, so listen, um, how much due diligence do you guys do when you pull this bullshit? He said, what do you mean? I said, do you know I sue Six, Six Flags? They're twice as fucking big as you. Wow. And I, and I won. He goes, oh, uh, no, I didn't know. I said, yeah. I said, and here's the worst part. I said, you know, the phone number you call is a 212 area code. I go, yeah. He goes, you know what that means, right? I'm a New Yorker. And you know what's even worse? This is what I said. I said, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew New Yorker who owns a trademark. You think I'm going to fucking let you get away with this shit? This is what I, I, wow. I really get obnoxious. I said, if you do this shit, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sign a band and call them the Harley Davidsons and send you a fucking guitar <laughs> pick as a thank you. There you go. There you and go. And he called me up. He goes, what do you want? I said, I want 10% of the tire and two fat boys a year. And he, called me up the next day. <laughs> and he calls me up the next day and he goes, we're rescinding our request. Yeah, I, I bet. I bet. That's how, and that's how that went down. I mean, you play hardball with people. They're going to be stupid in your face and actually pull this bullshit. You know, uh -huh. I had a food truck in Minneapolis called the Twisters of Food Truck. You have to stop it. You own the trademark. Mm -hmm. They went on the radio. We're being harassed by a heavy metal band, millionaires. What do they care? What do they care? So the local radio station, the FM station, decides to get me on the air. And they go, we got J.J. French here, the owner of the trademark, and uh, so on the food truck. Why are you harassing these guys? And I said, well, I got something very simple to say. And they said, what is it? I said, why isn't it called the Motley Crue food truck? Mm -hmm. Why isn't it called the Rolling Stones food truck? Why isn't it called the Led Zeppelin food truck? You know why? Because those bands would sue your fucking asses out of the fucking window. So you think I'm going to sit back while you screw me? I said, are you, you consider yourself a good American? I said, good Americans don't steal from other Americans, you piece right. of crap. I said, come up with your own unique name. Because if you come up with a unique name and I take it from my band, you would yeah. sue me. So screw right. you. And what, they, was, like, what, what was the initial is, offer? This is just obnoxious nonsense like twisted sister is a billion dollar name i know mm -hmm. the fact that the trademark is valuable i mean let me say this about uh, say this about twisted if you look at other bands that made it in 1973 that were created in 73 like we were you have Aerosmith, you have kiss you have judas priest acdc twisted Sister. that's a heavy that's an incredible lineup of bands sure, absolutely 73 if you would ask all of us Back in 1973, how long we would last? We would have said five years. That was mm -hmm. like the standard answer, you know, five mm -hmm. years. Here we are 50 years later, right? Aerosmith, Kiss, Judas Priest, ACC's Twisted System. Now, even though those bands had albums out before we did, the fact that we have all survived and thrived is a testament to how great all of these bands are. Right. But this is the best part. You ask a 10 year old kid to sing a kiss song, kid probably won't know one off the top of his head. If you ask him to sing an ACDC song, may not know off the top of his head. Ask him to sing a Judas Priest song, at, you know, sing another thing coming, he's probably not going to finish the lyric. Mm -hmm. You know, ask a kid to sing Dream On, probably won't know, but the minute you sing, we're not going to take it, the kid is going to sing. Sure. We're not going to take it because we're not going to take it. it happens to be the most licensed heavy metal song in the world. Well, so think about all those football so, games. So, so yeah. if you hate, if you hate Twisted Sister, if you hate us, if you just think we suck beyond belief, too bad, because yeah. our fucking songs are going to live forever. <laughs> so, Boy, that's for sure. That's so, hey, you know, so, so. JJ, you've probably talked about it uh, uh, obviously a million times. We we go back. We know the history. Um, speak a little bit on those Wicked Lester days. The uh, you know there the, weren't uh, much days. You know, people talk about it. I wrote it as an afterthought. I never thought about it. I actually never thought about it. So one day, some uh, writer from Circus Magazine said, you ever been in another band? And I went, well, I, I, uh, I auditioned for, for, for Wicked Lester, Kiss's band, for like a couple of weeks. Well, tell me about it. I said, oh, I we used to babysit for a guy who was a lawyer, and he was a lawyer for the producer of Wicked Lester. And he said to me, after one day I was babysitting for his daughter, he says, by the way, you're looking for a, a gig. I, I know you play guitar. I can hear you play guitar in the building. You want to audition? And he gave me, I think, Gene's number or Gene gave me his number, whatever. And I called them and they came down, and they saw me play. And then we had a conversation and then they invited me to play with them for a couple of weeks. And that was in June of um, 72. 
And uh, I didn't get a call back from him. And I frankly didn't think of it one way or the other. I think what happened was um, about a week after that, I joined an Allman Brothers cover band. Wow. And we, we wound up moving to a hippie commune in Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. Wow. And spent the whole summer in the commune rehearsing and then playing exactly one show on Labor Day weekend and the band broke up. Um, and sadly, by the way, the, the guitar player, Richie Excellente of that band, just died two days ago, sadly. But oh, that's yeah, that was sad. He said he had, he had uh, throat cancer. It was, it was horrible. But anyway, um, so I didn't think twice about it. So I come back to New York City and glam had hit really big. You know, it's September 72. Hunky Dory, Ziggy Stardust, T-Rex, mm. Lou Reed, Walk on the Wild Side, mm. Martha Hoople, all the young dudes just just took over everything. And the Dolls were playing in a local at a club downtown and I knew them and knew you know we knew them because they were part of the scene in the New York scene before they put the makeup on so I would go down to see them and I thought oh they look great I just thought they were terrible as a band they couldn't play but they looked amazing and I said it I'm very consistent about my comment I said it to a record company executive who asked me when I walked out of the Mercer Arts Center one day, what do you think of the band? And I said, what do I think of the Dolls? I said, if they learn how to play, they can make a lot of money. They look amazing. They just suck. Those those were my words, you know. So for all the historical uh, um, uh, backpedaling, oh, the Dolls are this, the Dolls are the Dolls are this, they were a terrible rock band that looked really good. And, you know, by the way, their singers said they were a terrible rock band. I'm not saying anything that David Johansson hasn't said about his own fucking band. <laughs> Right. They were terrible. And they were so bad. But you know what? There was something that was interesting. It was like watching a car crash. And they were really good once. I saw them probably 20 times. And they were really good once at the film where they the reopened from where they played and they were good. But, you know, Arthur couldn't play bass anymore. He was being propped up on mic stands. And the bass mm. player was Peter Jordan behind the stacks because Arthur wow. couldn't play. So I don't not dissing this band. Right. I give them all the credit in the world for you know, carrying on a glam kind of a thing, but they they were not particularly good. And, and here's what I say about entrepreneurs. Let's talk about the book for a minute, okay? Mm -hmm. Why do you become an entrepreneur? You become an entrepreneur for one of two reasons. Either you've invented something the world's never seen and you're willing to risk everything in, that you have to show this to the world, or you want to improve an existing model and you're willing to risk everything you have to, to improve the existing model. Well, when it comes to rock bands, there's plenty of existing models. So I wanted to improve on the dolls. And so the Twisted Sister idea was to be a band that looked good, that looked like that, but, but could, could play. play. Right. And the, but the thing is, we didn't have originals in those days. We were a copy band. Well, you know, the way you get good is you're a copy band. That's how you mm -hmm. learn. You learn, you learn the ro ropes first, and then you transition. Hopefully, you transition over. I give the dolls credit. You know, they came out of the box. They did originals. And, you know, people want to talk about personality crisis and Frankenstein and how great it is. I'll never play that shit. But, you know, okay. I give them, you know, I give them credit. They, you look, there's a picture of me with David Bowie, which is a, around at one of the shows. Bowie came. I had just seen Bowie the night before at, the, at uh, Carnegie Hall with the Spiders. You want to talk about a great band? Wow. wow yeah that was a great band Mitt okay Ronson. so bowie comes down to see the dolls because the dolls are the hip thing and there's a picture of me sitting in front of david bowie at the mercer arts center i don't know what he thought of him maybe he just thought they were so cool it was part of the andy warhol crowd you know the super downtown crowd but i never got it the reason why i never understood it was i spent five years at the film or four years at the film Maurice watching the greatest bands in the world on a weekly basis you know i was watching zeppelin and and the who and and you know and Jethro Tull and and Crosby, Stills and Nash and and Jeff Beck and you know the Zeppelin. I saw them open for, I saw Zeppelin open for Iron Butterfly and I saw the Woody Herman Orchestra open for Led Zeppelin, and you and Jimi Hendrix because they played every night. So you saw these artists every single night. So when you get five four years of constantly seeing the greatest rock artists in the world, and they infuse your passion. You know, I talk about inspiration in my book, The Eye and Twisted is inspiration. You know, what is inspiration is the fuel that fuels you until you start making money. You know, you're mm -hmm. inspired. Mm -hmm. So with with the belief that I could be that, you know, the next Jeff Beck, the next Jimmy Page, whatever, I would go to the Fillmore and come home at night, four o'clock in the morning, put a guitar on my shoulder, stand in front of the mirror and go, yeah, I'm that guy sure. that was the what inspired me so when the dolls came out i was like that's where we've evolved to <laughs> yeah that's where right. civilization evolved to to like three chords now having said that 
When the Ramones came out, people said, well, they're simple. The Ramones had something going for them. I don't know. I love the Ramones. Mm -hmm. They had an attitude about them. They knew exactly who they were. And they did it exactly the way they should have done it. Right. So I, they're a different animal. They were simple, but damn, were, they were great. Yeah. I mean, you know what's opinion. funny is when you're sitting there describing the New York Dolls, you can almost, that's the, the same as the Sex Pistols. They could not play. They were terrible. But yet they're this punk icon. Here's Sid Vicious who could hardly play his instrument. So it, it was very similar, very similar yeah, but story. They, one big difference. They made one of the greatest albums in history. Mm -hmm. And they made an album that's so good. And the controversy is who played on the record. Right. That's mm -hmm. the right. controversy. Right. They, you know, it's like, I, I just, I just, my, my podcast this week currently is with Steve Lillywhite, the producer who produced Johnny mm -hmm. Thunder's first solo album, So mm -hmm. Alone. Which is the JJ, the French Connection. Yeah. And we're going to talk right, about the that. JJ French Connection beyond yep. the music. And I asked him, I said, um, did Chris Spedding play guitar? because Chris is a great studio guitar player. And the rumor was that he played all the guitar parts. So I don't know who played the guitar parts on, on, on the Sex Pistols record, but I will say it's a great God. Well, they record. debate the bass playing parts too. And it comes, comes down to uh, Sid might've played maybe this verse and this chorus. I don't think he played, I, I doubt he was even on the record. But no, he was there yeah. for the, he was there because he was a punk. <laughs> and, and that was pretty much it, you know? Yeah, but uh, but they, they, they made a, uh, they, I know people who saw them in the States and said they were pretty horrible. We, okay, now here's a story for you. We, uh, we live in Tulsa. They only played seven U.S. shows, and the sixth one was here at the Canes Ballroom. And when he was here, he put his fist through the wall in the dressing room, and they now have that hole <laughs> framed. They took the wall out, and, the whole, and it's framed, and it's in the office. Or somebody owns it, or I don't know. Johnny Rotten punched this hole? Yeah. No, Sid, Sid Vicious. Vicious. Sid Vicious, oh, Sid Vicious did. punched this Yes, hole. yes. So that's you know really... Anybody? Do you know anyone who went to the show? You were what, four years old? At the oh, time? I was. We were about eight, about eight years old. So it was nineteen seventy eight, I believe, or yeah, right. seventy seven, seventy eight. And uh, no, I didn't live here then, so I wouldn't attend. And I don't think my parents would have let me go to that. But uh, <laughs> no, I do know there's a lot of pictures online of it. It was a snowy night, and they were here, and they came to they came to Tulsa, um, and there was picketers, and uh, they had mm. played in Dallas the night before, and of course the last show was in San Francisco. So really cool kind of history. I'm a, I'm a kind of a history guy like that, and if I could that is cool. If that I could very, if very I could cool. tell you ask you a question here, I was reading that your mom worked for the uh, JFK campaign. I'm I'm a big history guy. What do you remember about that? So my mother was a political consultant for every major Democratic candidate in New York in the '60s. So my memory was clear. In my book, there's a picture of me standing in front of the Kennedy campaign headquarters oh, mm. on the Upper West Side with a big Kennedy button. <laughs> um, my mother worked for Adlai Stevenson's campaign, and then he lost the primaries to Kennedy, and she switched over to Kennedy. Mm. So then she went from Kennedy to Bill Ryan, Manfred Ornstein, Albert Blumenthal, um, Bentley Casals, Ted, Ted Weiss, who was a congressman, um, Jerry Nadler, who's on the Defense Committee in co Congress. She was his first campaign manager my mother wow. when he was a community organizer she was his she was his consigliere my parents were super left-wing uh parents very progressive and um you hear sirens in new york by the way welcome, <laughs> yeah. to, new york. welcome, new york. welcome to new york you know uh a awesome. little bit of little, little vibe for you a little yeah. death wish vibe <laughs> for you. Yeah. um so i i my parents were i was very very conscious of of the whole scene and, and the Upper West Side is about as blue as you get. You know how like Texas could be red? Well, I live in the bluest of the bluest of the bluest of the bluest. You can't even, red, you can't even wear red socks in this neighborhood. <laughs> I mean, you'd be, you just can't. So I, this is a super, super left-wing town. And my parents were part of this group of super left-wing wingers. And, um, you know, I go into the detail in my book. You know, I went to a camp that was um, a progressive camp of mostly sons and daughters of former members of the Communist Party back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. My parents left the party. They were members of the party. They left the party because wow. uh, they found it. They, they, it was exposed for being, you know, basically sucked and they, they left it. And um, and I would spend my summers at this place called the Briel Farm um, in upstate New York, which was where Pete Seeger was and and. Paul Robeson and, and, you know, so we were surrounded by politics 
And, and when I was in, and so we were anti-war, pro-civil rights. It was, my mother was campaign, was the campaign manager for Constance Baker Motley, who I'm sure you guys don't know. Mm. But she's the first black woman to be elected to the New York State Senate. My mother was a campaign manager. Wow! Well, so, your, mom, your mom was in this for for her life. She this was she did this for a long time. Oh, yeah, and, and, yeah, and, yeah. This was her. She was her passion. Wow! So it, so you know James Meredith was the African American who had to enter the University of Mississippi under the guise of the National Guard because right. he was being kept out. So Bobby Kennedy sent the National Guard. Well, when he when he was permitted to go to the University of Mississippi, he was represented by Kansas Baker Motley at the Supreme Court. And so when she ran for Congress, um, they brought James Meredith to New York to campaign for her. And my mother and I picked James Meredith up at the hotel mm -hmm. and brought him up to Harlem. I was 11 mm -hmm. to campaign for Kansas Baker Motley. So uh, <clears throat> that was the era, you know, that I grew up in. Now the the background with all those uh, platinum and gold records that's the same house that, or apartment excuse me that you've lived in since what 1958 yeah. is that right or yeah wow that's amazing what what yeah. what made you decide to stay there or or do you own those are other New York property? rent laws those are, you have to understand the New York rent laws you probably heard about rent control rent stabilization they're they're Byzantine laws that existed and, and most people stayed in their apartments forever because they were they were um you know they were they were inexpensive to live in and so i stayed in the apartment and um eventually i uh the the building went condo and i was able to buy my apartment oh, wow. uh, eventually uh but yeah this is the, the apartment i grew up in and the room i'm in now talking to you yeah. is in the very bedroom that I took acid and wow. listened to the Grateful Dead. In <laughs> oh my gosh, that's incredible. Yeah, this is, that wall behind me, that had, that had, that had posters that used to melt on command. Behind sure. Me. Um, I've had those days myself. Those are, those are long gone, but yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, so it's kind of cool. You know, this is kind of like where I am, you know, like I, I appreciate when I watch a TV show like Yellowstone mm -hmm. and I watch the Duttons trying to protect, you know, the homestead. You know, because this is where the Duttons have been for hundreds of years. Well, this is where I've been. <laughs> this sure. is like, this is my home. Like when I when I moved in, West Side Story was filming exteriors for the movie in '61. Wow, '60. So, um, the Warriors is filmed up here. I mean, there's so many movies filmed on my block. I can't even begin to tell you because that's what the West Side is. It's like a million. When Harry met Sally, you know, at the, or you've got mail, the last thing that you've got mail is they're in a little garden, Riverside Drive, that's right down the street from my house. I mean, that's just, New York City's a very cool. I came on my 50th birthday. The Upper West Side was my favorite part. That was my cool. favorite area, actually. Um, yeah, it's, it was, uh, it did you cool. enjoy your visit? Oh, man, listen, you know, because I mean, music's been my life. So my destinations were the Dress to Kill album cover corner. I went to the Chelsea Hotel. I went to Electric Lady. Uh, I went to... Uh, you know, I found the cool spot. Oh, the, the Holy Grail was the Dakota for me. I'm a Beatles fanatic, <laughs> yeah. so. so yeah, see. so you know I write a Beatle column, right? I did not know that, yeah, but I will I, actually yeah, look. I am I will a, look. I'm a Beatleologist. I wrote. I write wow, a Beatle column. Wow, me and you could have some conversations. I, I'm a fanatic. Um, so, uh, so I know a lot of tons of Beatles stories, um, uh, and of course, I was 11 when the Beatles came to America. Um, when the night that that Lennon was killed, I was on the first date with my first wife and uh, I walked home and turned the radio on and, and heard he had shot. So I just said to her, I'll see you later. Mm -hmm. And I spent the whole night in front of the Dakota. Oh, it was surreal to me to be able to go there after seeing that. I mean, yeah. I remember I was 10 years old watching Little House in the Prairie I'm, I, in San Diego, California, and they came on and said John Lennon had been mm -hmm. murdered. So mm -hmm. your whole life you see that footage and all those people that had gathered around the Dakota that night and then you go there and it's just, Wow, that was kind of like just surreal. It was, it was, it yeah. Was really so, cool. the couple of things you should know. Um, so I'll give you some inside Beatle stuff. The very last interview that John Lennon did was with the BBC, and they had a guy who came into the New York for two weeks and stayed with John and Yoko to do a story on the album Double Fantasy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so he did, he wrote a book, it's called The Last Interview. And, um, on because uh, Lennon was killed December 8th, on December 7th, about 24 hours prior to his de death, he was at the kitchen table with this with this journalist. And this was the last question the journalist asked him. How safe do you feel in New York? Oh, my goodness. That was the last 
question. And of course, he, he felt asked. very safe. They walked very everywhere. Very safe. He said, yeah. you know, he said, Bowie told me to move up here. I was living downtown. He said, the people up here are great. He goes, I walked to uh, my favorite restaurants around the corner. We go for a dessert all the time. The doormen all say, hey, John, how's Julian? You know, how's the baby? Blah, blah, blah. blah. Right. He said, this is the safest place in New York. That well, was his see, last You see interview. footage of them walking Central Park yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Too bad. Well, that's where Strawberry Fields is directly yeah. across the street. Yeah, I but there. I will tell you, this is a Beatles story that only I could write. And I wrote this for Gold Mine magazine. And by the way, if you go on goldmine.com, you will see my latest review. I do a review of Get Back. Okay. Okay. Cool. So I, will just, I will find that because Should again, I'm a fanatic. Yeah. So. And he mentioned um, Electric Lady, and uh, that's yeah, well, something we that you recorded. have. Well, it's funny because I just spoke to Eddie Kramer this morning. Yeah, Eddie Kramer, the, our producer who, who brought us to Electric Lady to produce our first demos mm -hmm. uh, in 1979. But I'll tell you a Beatles story that will that will kind of make your hair stand up. Okay. So, uh, about nine years ago, I was having problem with my cable, and uh, I call up time warner and i said i want you to send somebody who can really fix it don't send me some like 19 year old kid who doesn't know what the hell he's doing i want a senior executive you know so about a week later the door opens and it's a older african-american gentleman gray hair balding he definitely looks like he's 60 and he goes you're the guy with the cable problem and i go yeah and he walks in the apartment and he goes i guarantee you these young kids today don't know what they're doing blah 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 I will make sure your cable problems fixes it. Thank you. While he's in my living room, he looks up and I have a eight foot long, double black and white, one of a kind, uh, double photo of the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show, one on stage and one behind the stage. That that uh, That is the only one, and I know for a fact, it's the only one of its kind. And it just, it's because I'm a Beatle fanatic. And I have it in my living room. And he's and he's looking at the picture while he's working on the modem. And, and I'm not paying attention to what he's saying. And, and he says he says these words he goes he goes that john lennon cat i was there the day he arrived and i was there the day he left and i stopped i was walking around the house i said excuse me he goes that john lennon cat man i was there the day he arrived i was there the day he left and i said what are you talking about he said how old are you and i said at the time i was 60 he goes i'm 60 you're 60. he goes so you were in sixth grade in 1964 i said yeah he said, where'd you grow up? I said, here. He said, well, I grew up in Queens. He goes, in fact, my school was across the street from Idlewild Airport, which is what it was called before it was JFK. Mm -hmm. And he goes, so we were in Idlewild Airport selling candy on the uh, afternoon of uh, February 7th, 1964, when the Beatles landed. And he said, we're selling candy. Next thing you know, there's police everywhere, girls screaming everywhere, and these four guys, mop top guys, come walk, walking right by me. Mm. And I realized it's the Beatles. And I run home, I go, mama, mama. I." I, I, I was there. They walked right by me. The Beatles, the guys on the TV, they walked right by me at the airport. And I went, that's very cool. He goes, yeah, man. But on December 8th, 1980, I was working for Western Union. I was delivering a telegram to the Dakota. And after I delivered the telegram, I walked around the corner and heard the gunshot. Oh, oh my God. I was there the day he arrived and I was there the day he left. Oh, my oh, God. Wow. Oh, and I wow. said to him, you're the only human being on this planet who could ever say those words. Oh my wow. gosh, that is unbelievable. I was there the day he arrived and I was there the day he left. And, and I wrote an art, I wrote a story in Goldmine on that one. Well, you know? we will definitely go check yeah. that out. So hey, I am, yeah, so I have a Beatle column in, I have a Beatle column in Goldmine called Now We're 64. Huh? I have an audio column in Copper, um, which you can also, you know, Copper Magazine is an online audio magazine connected to PS. Audio. I'm going to look for those because I'm the Beatle fanatic here. I think, I think Scott's got another well, question. Yeah, for I was you. wanting to get back to your um, uh, JJ, uh, the French connection. Um, I, I know I, I've watched something where you explained to, to someone who was interviewing you about young uh, people who didn't grow up with this type of era and had to do all these sorts of like researching and, and all this stuff just to, to know that we're not that because we grew up you know listening to you guys you know that's we were those kids that like we you were with beatles we were with you guys mm -hmm. and so you know we had all the hit parader magazines and the circus magazines and would go and get all the you know the twisted sister stuff and and watching all the stuff on you know MTV, night, MTV. night flight and all these different things <laughs> what is the you know Explain a little bit your fascination and where you said uh, about the young people who have to interview you, and you, you said he was kind of fascinating to you. You remember that? 
It was a Cassius or something. Oh, that kid. Yeah. 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 Wow. That was an interesting interview because he didn't know a lot. You know, he was just I, I, look when you when you come out with a book, all of a sudden you're thrown into a giant pool of people who are going, oh, yeah, I think I'll talk to that guy. I think I'll talk to that guy. <laughs> Um, it's just an educational thing. I, look, I can't pretend that I'm not almost 70. Mm -hmm. So I hear things differently than you, than you. You know, you know how like you guys hear 80s music and you love it? Yes. Right. Like that's the music that you love. Well, the music that you listen to between the ages of 12 and 20 is the music that stays with you for the rest of your life. Right. I, I don't know if there's a scientific proof of that statement, but I believe it's anecdotally true. I believe that no matter what the music is between the age of 12 and 20, that's the music that will last with you for the rest of your life. That will put mm -hmm. a smile on your face for the rest of your life. It just so happened my 12 and 20 was the Beatles. So I had like the best. I had like the golden age, you know. So when I listen to that stuff, you know, I go back and I can immediately, you know, relate to that. But that's not what, that's not the music I listen to. I mean, outside of the Beatles, which I do because it's a job that I have and I'm endlessly fascinated by them and all their music. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a blues guy and mm -hmm. blues is timeless and blue, blues is timeless. So it doesn't matter what year the song was recorded. And you can go back to the Robert Johnson recordings of 19 in the, in the 30s. Um, but blues makes me happy. So on Saturday morning, and when I want to listen to music, I'll put on, you know, Albert King or Sonny Boy Williamson or Muddy or big bill brunzi or you know like there's thousands of different ones i just you know i can listen to them all day long that is music that i is it because of the guitar playing or is it because is it is it are you attracted to the blues guitar playing or the, well, that's the emotion of the songs of that and that at that period of time remember we had cream you know you have to remember the biggest difference in the beatles and the stones were the beatles were a rock and roll band the stones were a blues band they're very different bands yes. very 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 different in how they evolved i agree the beatles were never a blues band ever 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 the rolling stones were a little bit of a rock and roll band but they're mostly a blues band they're mm -hmm. just a bigger blues band where the beatles were a pop band mm -hmm. they were they were and it was a very different orientation so where the beatles were like little richard and jerry lee lewis you know roy orbison the everly brothers the rolling stones were simply you know sonny boy williamson and and muddy waters and and, and, and willie dixon and right. some, you know all that stuff so it's a real 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 big difference but if you look at the big at the big six well the big five which is beatles stones who's up floyd if you look at those five bands which i believe uh, are the mount rushmore of bands um in my opinion no matter Rushmore bands, and you may say, "Well, how come there's no American bands there?" And I say, uh, and, I will, and I will give you an example of why America is great, but it's very different. British have given us the Beatles, Stones, Who's Up, Floyd. They're all very different bands. They're all very, very unique. They're all like very, very special, and they're all special. And you could put Queen in there, pretty much. They're pretty much like closing in now, you know, on that pantheon. Sure. Um, but what America has is we've got good bands, but we don't have Beatles, Stones, Who's Up, Floyd, and Queen. I don't care. You can argue. You can tell me The Doors. You can tell me The Birds. You can tell me Van Halen. You can tell me The Grateful Dead. No, no, I'm sorry. Beatles, Stones, Who's Up, Floyd, Queen. You close the door on that shit in terms of like the Mount Rushmore. But what America has, America has Elvis. America has Dylan. America has Sinatra. America has Aretha. America has Orbison. America has... Um, Springsteen, America has petty, America has individuals, and England has groups. And it's actually, I believe, a much larger sociological I never, difference. I never thought of it like that. It's yeah. actually much a bigger sociological difference uh, because groups, that's what England gave us the best of was groups, and we give the best as wow. individuals. So if you look at our individuals and you go Hendrix, Elvis, Dylan, I mean, there's a Mount Rushmore right there, man. Right. You can't, I mean, okay, so you can argue you got Elton John, you got Bowie. Okay, I'll give you that. But you don't have Elvis and Dylan and Jimmy. <laughs> you, you follow yeah. what I'm saying here? Yes, right. for we sure. Have, we have individuals that are monumental because we're an individualistic society. Again, this is a very broad-based philosophy. But this is kind of like my view. England tends to give us bands and, and collaborative groups and america tends to even when we have groups in america they're ma named after one person it's bruce springsteen and the east street band it's mm -hmm. tom petty and the heartbreakers you know you get me here this is yes. this is what america tends to do 
it tends to it tends to push a person out and, and, and or it's the individual so you know does england have a sinatra no they don't they've got good but they don't have that you know do they have an elvis they got cliff richard they don't have fucking elvis they have a dylan though they got donovan that ain't fucking dylan sorry <laughs> we have monumental individuals now does that mean that van halen isn't great no or Aerosmith isn't great or kiss isn't great no they're all they're great they're great but it's not in my mind the Beatles Stones who's that Floyd Queen. It's just not. Sure. If you look at those acts, what they meant artistically, sociologically, commercially, you're talking monolithic at a level that's beyond description. Right. So it's just again how I tend to view things. And and again Bowie's I, a different, you know, a, a separate ordeal, you yeah. know, Bowie. Yeah, may I may I ask a question real quick? Um, I would be remiss if I did not ask you what your current level of connection and relationship is with D and the other guys from the band right now. We talk every day. Awesome. That's good. We have to because we have a company yeah. that licenses our music. That's right. So every single day, I get a text from them. That's great. Me, Eddie, Mark, D, every day. Tell hey you know, tell. So, Tell me about AJ. You know, I want to know about oh, AJ, his contributions to Twisted yeah. Sister. I mean, and um, he, he's definitely missed. AJ is to us the way John Bonham was to Zeppelin, mm. or the way, or the way Keith Moon was to the Who. Um, and, and 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 kudos to Mike Portnoy for being yes, Mike Portnoy, and for being one of the greatest drummers who walked the earth. But to Twisted Sister, AJ. When he died, it took a piece of me with me, with him. So when people say, don't you want to play again? My answer is if AJ was alive, I would consider it. Yeah. Not that there are not amazing drummers and not that Mike Portnoy didn't do a spectacular job, not to mention the fact that he's one of the nicest, most respectful individuals in the world who you couldn't have asked for a greater person to come in. It was, it was AJ's guy. I mean, AJ said, if anything ever happens to me, get Mike Portnoy. Both of them played in the same band, Adrenaline Mob. And talk about a band that was snake bit, by the way, hmm. with, with disaster. You know, it was that. Um, but, um, AJ was something special. And we've gone through six drummers before AJ. AJ, wow. right. or five drummers. AJ was a six. Um, AJ was just a special. He was just special. He was, he was for sure. That, he, he was that piece. You know, me and AJ had this little thing. He would call me Mr. French because <laughs> the family of Mr. French were family affair. Yeah. So what we had a routine. And the routine was that every year we'd get together to do the summer festivals. And every year we'd meet after taking, you know, the, the, the winter off. And we get to the rehearsal space and we'd walk in and after we bullshit for a while, tell some jokes, what's going on, what's your favorite restaurant, blah, blah, blah. We would we would get ready to, to do the first song. And the first song was always shoot him down. Yeah. Always. And after we would tune up and blah, 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 I look at AJ, I go, I go, Mr. Pirro. And he'd go, Mr. French. And he would count it off. Mm. Wow. And that would be the beginning of the season you know the the next festival season which of course right we, which we did for 14 years we came back in 2003 and we thought we were going to last two years and we lasted 14. right and you know like what can you say about d best front man in the business i don't care you know in my opinion best front man yeah no one was better no one was more equipped nobody was more professional you even uh, said so much our, he's better than well than Ozzy, right? And when that, and that kind oh, of a... he's, he's better than all of them because he's more professional than all of them. Mm -hmm. He never takes it for granted. D comes to every show and he does a two hour warm up every night. And he's done that since 1976. Wow. In other words, he lives to be great. Mm -hmm. He never phones it in. When I say he's better than Ozzy, but what, what I'm saying is that I can't see another singer be as professionally tuned into the art of of entertainment yeah the way d is a great he, singer spectacular entertainer um no, knows how to handle an audience doesn't think twice about a hundred thousand people does always healthy sleep. took on the responsibility always healthy yeah always healthy i mean just you know we have our disagreements but from a professional standpoint then again mark mendoza is one of the greatest bass players i've ever 
played with in my life. And Eddie Ojeda, you know, we call him Fingers, but he should be Steady Eddie because he plays perfectly. <laughs> We've seen him on the cooking show. <laughs> every, but Eddie, every night, Eddie plays exactly perfect. I should, I should show JJ. This is my VHS copy right here. Now I got to tell you, this is my VHS copy from 1984 of Twisted Sister live in San Bernardino from the MTV Saturday Night Concerts. 1984. I've held this for 38 years just to show you. <laughs> <laughs> right here. Do you, and, do you want a and, DVD copy of it? Uh, yeah. Do you got one? <laughs> they make. You them. have I'm, one. I'm, I, I may have one floating around. I would love to have one. Maybe this one. We're done. That... I, we're, you know what? You have my emails. So email me an address. If I can find one in the warehouse, I'll send you a copy. Awesome. Now I got to tell you. I got to ask you. I, what I remember most about this concert is that you guys played "I Want to Rock" twice. Okay. You don't. You don't <laughs> remember that. Play, no. 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 It happened on a couple of occasions. Oh, okay, um, it's we a, were filming. We were filming shows, and the director would say, "Can do it again." Gotcha. So it's not unusual. I remember doing that a couple of times with a couple of songs. This was a good concert. I I, I made sure that I I got it. I re retained my copy of it, and it's got it's got a printed label and everything. I printed a label off and everything for it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it was great. It was great. So the, the only time the oh, I'm sorry, your, your mic is the only it? time. Yeah, your mic's kind of cutting out the, on us. Sorry, you're good. Try it again. Uh, well, anyway, can you hear me now? I don't. I think the connection's kind of bad. There you go. The only time I was able to see you live, it was at Rocklahoma 2007. Me and her uh, playing in a band. We got to um, open up um, in the in the early afternoon. Mm -hmm. But um, when you guys arrived, I saw D. Snyder backstage, and he was going back into. I guess it was some kind of cabin or whatever that was on location and i was running up to him saying d d and he turns around and he's like what <laughs> that's d and i was like I, I was just gonna like shake his hand and, and talk to him but he's when he said what i said i froze i said have a good show and yeah. i just turned around <laughs> too intimidating he was very intimidating yeah totally oh man he's um you know you know what's interesting about that night what's we that? only did two we only did two shows that year oh really we played the Arctic Circle, and then oh, we wow. flew from the Arctic Circle to Oklahoma. No kidding. And we, yeah, so we we flew from New York City to uh, Oslo, Oslo to uh, Tromso, Tromso to Laxalb, and then a four-hour bus drive to get to the Arctic Circle, where we did a show at four o'clock in the morning with the sun up in the sky. Wow. It was in July with deep purple to the drunkest people I've ever seen in my life. Like they drink more. I can't even tell you how much they drink, the, 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 but when they walk around, they all look like extras from night of the living dead. They're just like freaking. And, and I'm, Dee's looking at me, I'm looking at him. It's like four in the morning. The sun's bright in the sky. I'm looking at him going, is this fucking wacky or shit? We're in the Arctic circle. You know, we're in the Arctic circle. And then we stayed awake and we flew uh, 24 hours to Oklahoma. So we went from, Jeez. Tromso, to, uh, we went from Laxel to Tromso, Tromso to Oslo, Oslo to New Jersey, uh, Newark, Newark to Oklahoma, and then played Rocklahoma and then flew home. So in one 80 hour stretch, we, we covered like 12 time zones, right. wow. thousands of miles and, uh, and did two shows. And, um, and when I got home, my wife looked at me and said, how do you feel? And I, my comment was, I used to pay money in high school to get in this condition. <laughs> That's funny. I have no desire to feel this this wasted. So I do remember that Rock Hall show. It was a fun show. Did you have a good time? Oh man, those are those are great shows. I st I don't know if his mic is working or not. Get, oh. um, give us a check here, real quick, Scotty. No, it was. Uh, yeah, it's it's, not it's cut now. Well, yeah, it it was a great show. And listen, you've you've been on with us for more than an hour. Very gracious of you. We appreciate that. I want to ask. One quick thing, if the guys have any closing questions, they can come in right after me. But real quick, we, you know, we talked about the grind of making it in music. When I watch y'all's 2014 documentary, which everyone oh. has to watch, it's, oh, it's, great. it's so awesome. And I mean, it exhausted me watching it. I can't imagine what it was like living it. But tell me if you disagree or agree with this. It seems like now in 2022, it it's probably much harder to quote unquote make it and the reason I say that is because you know back in those days I mean 
th- what you guys did blew people's minds. Now, every Tom, Dick, and Harry throws their, their YouTube video up of themselves shredding or pounding the drums or, you know, singing like a bird. So I think people have become desensitized to all of the, all of the talent, and it's just really hard to impress people now. So if you have young artists coming to you and saying, JJ, I want to make it. I want to make it in music. You know, how, how can I do this? What are you telling people in 2022? Because this is such a different landscape and environment now than it was back in your day. Well, first of all, if I was 20 years old, I wouldn't ask a 70-year-old his opinion. I honestly wouldn't. <laughs> I would tell the right. kid to go fuck himself and figure it out. Because actually, that's, how, that's, my, that's my automatic response, which is, are you fucking kidding me? Gotcha. Don't ask me. You're 20. You know how the world is. I don't know your fucking world. And the truth is that in 1973, if I were to ask a 70-year-old entertainer how to make it, they wouldn't give me the right advice. Yeah. Because they're because the playing field is completely different. Gotcha. So my attitude, I hate to sound this way, but if you have to ask me that question, you're in the wrong business. I got gotcha. you. If you got to ask that question, you're not ready for success. Because anyone who instinctively knows, knows that you have to look at your playing field and do what people are doing these days. My life and your life is not the same. Yeah. When I was 20, gasoline was 23 cents a gallon. Right. When I was 20, hotel rooms are $19 a night. When I was 20, you could rent a house for 300 bucks. Yeah. That's a different world. Sure. We don't live in that world anymore. If I'm 20 years old, you know what I'm doing? Here's what I'm doing. I'm looking at other artists who are 20 years old and going, what are they doing? What exactly are they doing? And then you copy it. Right. You copy it until you figure out a way to do it and become original. And nothing gets me crazier than watching American Idol or The Voice mm-hmm. and hearing the winter, the winner, give this impassioned speech at the end in which they say, I want to thank my fans for staying with me for 15 weeks. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. I want to throw the fuck up. I understand. You know, I just want to throw up because you know what? Um, There's no, there is no alternative to excellence. There's no alternative to working hard. Mm -hmm. And if somebody makes it because they didn't work hard and you think that's a great example, then you deserve what you get. Sure. That's all. So if I'm 20 years old, I'm looking around going, okay, TikTok, this guy's making this, okay, okay, I get it. Those are the rules. I'll follow those rules. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did when I was 20. I said, how do you, how do you make it in the car? You, you have to play these songs to play in the bars, to get the jobs, to do the job. That was it. That was my, that was the way the landscape looked for me Sure. when I was 20. So look at the way the landscape looks. It's not rocket science. It's called common fucking sense. All right. It's really what it is. Right. It is not rocket science. You know, and for people who, who, who look at me like Yoda and demand some like secret sauce, bullshit. Um, I knew you had to work, you had to work hard and you had to be innovative, you know, and that's why, what do I say in the book? Tenacity, wisdom, Mm -hmm. inspiration, stability, trust, excellence, and discipline, tenacity and wisdom, right? Being smart enough to understand, be smart enough to look around you. I want to do a quick plug, by the way. Twisted Sister has a new double vinyl album coming out awesome. uh, called Tear It Loose. It's uh, it's greatest hits vinyl on one album and 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 best of live performances from um, UK venues on the second vinyl album. That's going to be out later on in January. So Fantastic. keep an eye out for that. Um, in 2023, it'll be our 50th anniversary. Uh, I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to do a, a DVD of all the final shows from 2016 to release. Uh, in conjunction with that in a year from now, which is unbelievable. So my, 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 uh, my hope is that our fans stay safe, stay yes. healthy, not For get sure. COVID, um, be smart with that. Um, uh, and, um, and f- follow your dreams and, and never take the easy way out. Uh, sure. Cause that's not what I believe in. Sounds great guys. You got anything else? Well, I, I did read, or I saw where you were talking about watches and that you're kind of having an infatuation with watches. And I know that Dan Spitz from Anthrax, uh, I guess, makes clocks and, and he's watches. A watchmaker. Or, yeah, he's a watchmaker. Are you, are you guys friends? No, but, but Eric from uh, Kiss is a watchmaker. Oh, wow. I did not know that. 
Yeah, I mean, he's a watch fanatic and why he goes to all the watch shows. I mean, it's just weird, the side projects you love. You know, I love high-end audio. I'm a turntable guy, you know. And you probably would die to know that there are turntables in this world that sell for 400,000 bucks. You probably die oh my God. saying, why would there be a turntable that sells for $400,000? Don't ask me to give you a reasonable answer to it. But I will say that you can buy a car for $20,000 and you can buy a car for 3 million bucks. And it just depends on how you want to get from A to B. They both sure. have steering wheel and they both have four tires. So uh, I happen to be a high-end audio guy. Um, I sold high-end audio and I happen to be a turntable guy. So I like turntables and watches. I like mechanical things that go around. So do you, are you into albums to put on those turntables? Oh, I, I play vinyl all day. That's what okay, I play. so, 90, so I can imagine you probably have a killer Beatles collection. <laughs> A very extensive. Beatles yeah, yeah, I, I got a good yeah, one too. I, I, have I, a sick, I have a sick, I have a sick collection. But not only do I have a sick album collection, I've got a sick uh, EP collection. Mm. I've got one of the greatest uh, British EP Beatle collections you've ever seen. The kind oh, I'm of I'm sure. I'm sure. Do you ever put that stuff in? I mean, you got pictures of it anywhere? You put it on display anywhere? Um, you know, occasionally I put it up on I, 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 on on social media sites. I'll go take take a look at my collection of EPs. You know, and they go, wow, you know. Mm. that's incredible or you know i have i have two butcher covers for example oh, nice nice you know and i boiled off the front of them i bought oh, you, them. so you got peeled ones and you unpeeled them yeah yeah we found them for a dollar 99 in the cutout bin in 1968 oh at a record store down the village wow. uh, uh yesterday and today was a cutout can you imagine that it was a, it was a cutout so. yeah no no I, I you know i'm sorry we're sharing a mic here because well, well, have... hold on hold on hold on Oh boy, he's uh, gonna he's go gonna, get something. He's gonna show me Beatles stuff. That's it. We got another hour to go, folks. Uh, we yeah, try to check that real quick. It, it's, it's just a bad yeah. cable, unfortunately. Oh my gosh, JJ, we're gonna okay, we're oh, gonna go full wow. screen with you. Look at this, holy Moses! And you peeled that one. That's amazing. Oh, he can't hear me yet. Yeah, he's got his headphones off. It just so happened I had that out. Uh, That's yeah. incredible. So you peeled that one yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I don't know if I would have the balls to peel it, and I got to tell you. Well, we know. did. We we peeled two of them. First one didn't go so well. We got better at it the second time. Wow, that's beautiful, man. I, I saw one here at a local record store about three months ago for a thousand dollars, and I just I just couldn't pull the trigger on it at that moment. Mm. Yeah, you know, me... John Lennon had twenty five of them. Wow. And he was given a box, and he used to give them as tips at the Dakota. Wow! Really? He had Man. he had twenty five sealed ones. Yeah, I saw where some of those from a record executive went for about a hundred grand. I think it yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's stupid. It's yeah, really stupid. yeah. That's I'm sure you got your Beatles collection is, is far superior to mine. I'm proud of mine, but I'm sure yours is pretty. Uh, well, you know, it's just like, uh, is that your favorite band, or do you have other? Oh uh, well, okay. I'm a musician because of Kiss, but yes, the Beatles. The Beatles are my favorite <laughs> band. Yes. So I, I, I am a, a sick, I have about 140 albums right now. I, and I like to get the 45s, especially when they have the covers. And uh, yeah. so I'm sure you got some good stuff though. For sure. Yeah, it's fun. Oh. I have a collection that goes back, you know, to like the 60s. So yeah. Well, listen, we're, we're uh, because the mic has kind of crapped out on us, we're going to kind of start wrapping okay. things up. I yeah. want to, there is one more thing I want to, well, I want to plug your book again. I want to, let me find the, the screen with it here. Everybody, please go out and pick up a copy of Twisted Business, Lessons from My Life in Rock and Roll, J.J. French and Steve Farber. And, uh, and also, I want to plug your podcast, The French Connection. Now, this can be heard on Podcast One, but can it also be heard on Spotify and Apple yeah. as well? Yeah, and this yes, and I've got fifty episodes up right now. Um, this week is is uh, yeah, this week is, is Steve Lillywhite, okay, the producer. I've okay. had a lot of great producers, writers. All this is called Beyond the Music because it's not just music. Okay. Music is part of it. I'm, I have a couple of doctors coming on in the next uh, couple of weeks because I had prostate cancer, so I'm doing a show on prostate cancer. I'm doing a show on uveitis as my daughter has uveitis, which is the leading cause of blindness among young girls in America. So uh, she's fine, but 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 we have specialists on uveitis. I've had two heart operations for atrial fibrillation, so I'll probably have a couple of doctors to talk about AFib. Um, and uh, and then of course I have authors. I have authors and musicians. Um, a lot of different you know producers. It's a lot of fun. As my daughter has finally said to me, she says, Dad. If you can make money talking, you're going to be the richest man on earth. 
<laughs> well, you know, when I saw the We Are Twisted fucking sister, I, that's when I was struck. I was like, this guy's really, really smart and really has a lot to say. Yeah. And he made some money with Seven Dust as well. Yeah, yeah. you did. Yeah. Yeah. If, if we weren't short on time, we'd, we'd dig more into that story. Maybe you can come back on with us again sometime. But uh, again, guys, you've just spent an hour with one of the smartest business minds in the music business. We all have a lot to learn from him. Uh, excellent advice, great stories from the past. And uh, before we let you go, um, other than the podcast and the stuff you talked about coming out from Twisted Sister, anything else we should be watching out for uh, from you in 2022? No, in fact, I'm sitting here trying to think of my next project because the book took five years and the book is out. But I will say this about success. Um, the problem with the entertainment business is that when you have any success in the business, you're not allowed to enjoy it. The, the, minute, you, the minute you become successful, the, the next question is, so what are you doing next week? You know, it's like, would you fucking let me just enjoy this for five sure. minutes? So I'm enjoying the book. I'm enjoying the book's success. We sold out the first printing and the second printing is out now. So I'm very happy with that. I'm very, very happy. And I, and I, you know, what you can do is you want to reach me and you want to hire me for, for your, um, for your group, uh, for either consult, you know, for either music consultation or for motivational speaking, I uh, can be reached at askjjts at gmail.com. That's ask J J J A Y J A Y ask J J T S like twisted sister ask J J T S at gmail. And you can book me and, um, and, uh, and take this even, even further. So I'd like to appreciate, I want to thank you for having me on the show. I thank wanted to add you. that we uh, do have a chat room that's going on. We're live on multiple different platforms and there's a lot of your fans yes. that are in the chat room right now and they're asking a billion different questions and we just couldn't get to them. But you know, if you, if you can or whatever, if you want to answer some of them in the chat room, it'd be, uh, that'd be great. Um, but there is, so how do I get onto that? It's just right on. It would be, um, it'd be well, Tulsa music stream, Tulsa music stream. Um, oh, okay. um, we can, sh sh I'll send you the link to it through your uh, email. Yeah. Um, it'll be, um, yeah. On Facebook. Yeah. Got a lot sure. of love JJ. Hey, we thank right. you so, sure. so much. And we thank definitely you, will be supporting you and all your efforts going forward. Make sure you tell everybody there. We said, Hey, from Tulsa and we hope to see you soon. Stay in touch with us. Let us know what else you got going on and we'll be glad to help you promote it. Anytime you want to come on with us. Thank you guys so much for being fans because without guys like you, the guys like us don't exist. It's really that simple. Right. It's, I can't even break it down to any simpler than that. That's you so work true. hard, hopefully people relate to it and then you have fans. And for any musician in the world, that is the end result. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, buddy. Thank you you have a great night. JJ French, Twisted Sister on Tulsa Music Stream. We'll talk to you soon, buddy. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Happy Take New care. Year. You too. All right. That was great. Very informative. Fantastic. And I'm sure his book is very informative. Yeah. Scott, I'm sorry about that. That was a bad timing on that. But you know that stuff happens. You guys can buddy up and, and share yeah, the mic. Do like Gene and Paul, man, and the mic together. Hey. Or yeah. John and Paul or whichever, yeah. Peter and Paul. It's okay. You can be married. You know what? You, you mess with getting the cord going. This will be a good time for us to run through the sponsors. And I was telling uh. everyone that we have a new one. And it's so appropriate that you, my friend, read this one. And I'm, I'm just going to put it up on the screen. We have added Bill's Bud Connection as a new advertiser here on Tulsa Music Stream. Nine, why don't you tell us about Bill's Bud Connection? Bill's Bud Connection, man. They need help getting you, or I'm sorry, do you need help getting medical marijuana cards? Right there, in-person rate, $60 plus the state fee. You come, you meet the team across uh, the state of Oklahoma, creating patient access points near you, includes the doctor visit and upload assistance. You got to text them. It's 918-521-9349. Yep. And you can go to one of their many patient drives, pre-register uh, your appointment at medcardsmadeeasy.com. Carolyn is, had, has been the one contacting us, asking us to advertise here on the stream. Uh, <laughs> and she said they have a lot of events coming up. So we cool. appreciate bill's bud connection reaching out to us reach out with a couple samples if you'd like and, and <laughs> you know where to find those us. will go straight to nine i will take those samples he's the consumer and he will be your guy now i want to also put up deb concerts now i'm not going to say a word because it's not my place to say a word but i need you guys to be paying attention uh for an announcement coming from deb concerts it's a good one yes and we're not going to talk about it because we're not going to talk about it but be watching it's coming out i think within 
last I heard, within the next week. So watch for a big concert announcement from them. Let's also talk about Identity Merch. It is cold outside, y'all. You need to get one of these hoodies. Thick hoodies. That they're, as a matter of fact, I'm wearing mine tonight. So if you go to uh, Tulsa Music Stream, our page, right at the top, you can click on our online store. You can pick up T-shirts. You can even get tank tops for when it does get warmer or one of those wonderful hoodies that we talked about. Thank you, Todd Cook, for for uh, handling that for us and for being a sponsor. We also want to thank Dustin Little at Oki PC practical technology and networking services for Oklahoma's local business community contact 918-640-0892 or email Dustin at okiepc.com also shout out to gregshipman.com and surviving Rock, Oklahoma we appreciate you guys so much we want to tell you about gosh guys we've already made it to episode 50, 50. I can't believe it and we have gotten the other half of the Iron Maiden's guitar arsenal Courtney Cox, she is so cool. She's so awesome. Funny. Funny, great. She's beautiful, and she's talented, and she's going to tell us what it's like to play with the Iron Maids, and she's going to tell us a whole lot more. So that is going to be on Sunday, January 30th at 6 p.m. Central that we'll be having her on. And I think you... you That'll be us after we get back from uh, Rock Island Fest. Yes. So. And I have good news for you guys. And... and, and you know, DEB concerts is part of that. They are. And, and you know what? I, I emailed Jack Russell and I told him that we were going to send him a shirt and it was on the way. And he wrote me back and said, awesome. Thank you so much. So we're really glad cool. uh, that this is just kind of a dream come true to be talking to these people that are definitely major influences in our music careers growing up. And, um, God, it's just been amazing uh, to do the this. The sponsors is great. I've always wanted that since I was like seven have some sponsors. Have I've some always wanted a weed sponsor. Well, you finally got one. Absolutely, <clears throat> I do. And then I joined a, a little league baseball team that had a sponsor on the right, board. right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your sponsor? Uh, well, I, I played for Rudy's Golf Shop and Oakwood Apartments and Mexican Village Restaurant in, in, really? in Coronado, California. I played little league. Yes. Wow. Man. So you asked, I gave you the answer. That's good. It's and, a good memory. And, yeah. I think my sponsor was just my mom. Well, that's a great sponsor, she, honestly. She drove me to and from basketball practice all the time. You'd see, like, other guys had, like, Dairy Queen or Pizza Hut. And you had, like, somebody, what's the Bad News Bears one? Construction company. Something, <laughs> something Bail Bonds on Bad News Bears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't great. remember what Bail Bonds it was, but. Oh, man. Funny <laughs> stuff. We really appreciate you guys. Man, uh, if you came in during the middle of the interview, or maybe you came in at the tail, or maybe you watched it from the start, Watch this thing again because, you know, we just we kind of needed to back up and get out of his way because uh, he had a lot to share. Yeah, yeah. My, my, I think my mic cord surrendered. It was like I can't compete. <laughs> <laughs> it gave up the ghost. It's like, nah, he's got this. It's man true. It's there. true. But what? A, yeah, he's a very insightful Ooh. guy, and he's seen it all. So. Um, you know, I'm sure it, I, the book, I'm excited to borrow it from you yeah. once you're done with it. Yeah, I will. I, I just think it's something we need. I know we're all kind of towards the tail end of our quote unquote career, but still there's life lessons to be learned in that book. And, and I did not I'm know if there was an audio book on, on this or not. And I was hoping he would laugh. Oh, you know, well, yeah. sometimes, you know, cause you know, you he's, hear Paul Stanley talking and you know, and he's right, a tough cookie, right, man. Right. He's an SMF. He, that's right. Yeah, I mean, the book, like, look thick you know can imagine having to read all that right hey it's <laughs> reading know. is good for you it's like a I vitamin agree. for the brain i agree i agree I take thought, one I thought the aj uh thing was really cool yeah yeah, yeah did yeah. that damn thing go out on you again Might not be the mic i think it i is. think it's the cable i think it did go out on you again you want to come here come here baby no, we're good. Come, come here, here baby it's cold outside we're good. oh there it is no, it's just cutting in and out oh, it's the red bitch. one well, that means it's time to go. Guys, one more time, please join us back here Sunday, January 30th at 6 p.m. Central for Tulsa Music Stream episode 50. Courtney Cox of the Iron Maids will be joining us. We hope you all have a great week. We hope your new year is off to a fantastic start. Thank you for all your support of what we're doing. We're just three local musicians having fun, and we're having fun with you, and we're having fun with, with our heroes. Talking now. rock and roll. It's pretty stinking cool. So we love you guys very much. Thanks for sharing the stream. Like and follow our page. Tulsa Music Stream will be back later in January on the 30th. You guys have a great week. We'll see you soon.
want to 